We're at the point in the course when we need to start talking about how to name compounds and molecules. This practice is known as nomenclature. So first off, in order to be successful at nomenclature, we need to be able to classify what we're looking at. So chemical bonds, that term covers a lot of ground. So a bond is simply an attraction or a force between atoms. We're going to subdivide chemical bonds into two categories. First, let's look at ionic bonds. So ionic bonds occur between metals and nonmetals. How do you quickly identify something as being ionic? So you're going to look at the periodic table. Your metals are to the left of the staircase and your nonmetals are to the right of the staircase. So I always like to think of ionic bonds as coming from elements that are on opposite sides of the periodic table, almost like uh, different sides of the track. Covalent bonds, on the other hand, are composed entirely of nonmetals. So we're looking at elements on the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table and don't forget about hydrogen, because hydrogen is kind of misplaced um, at the top of group one over there. Another difference between ionic and covalent bonds is what happens to the electrons. So for ionic bonds, electrons are transferred from the metal to the nonmetal. The elements are people in my head and they're part of the world's greatest novella. So, I mean, saying that electrons are transferred doesn't really make for an interesting story. So I always like to think about these electrons as being stolen. So a non-metal has the ability to just snatch an electron away from your metals. The covalent bonds, on the other hand, they share the electrons. So maybe not as interesting in the grand scheme of things. We need to have a way to depict an ionic bond versus a covalent bond. So the classic example of an ionic bond is sodium chloride. And what happens is sodium's all the way in group one and it loses one electron. So it has a plus one charge. And then it hooks up with chloride and chloride wants to gain one electron because it's in group seven. So chloride's like, yeah, I'll steal that electron from sodium. Now, they're attracted to one another, but they're not together. They have this attraction, but they're basically divorced. So they're gonna stay in the vicinity of one another, but they're not together together. So that's why we're going to um, designate the ionic bond with a dashed line. Covalent bonds are a little bit different in that the electrons are shared. So when we depict this, we're going to draw solid lines. They're called bonds, but they represent those shared electrons. There's no charge 
on any of the elements in a molecule, in a covalent molecule like water. And that's in stark contrast to the ionic bond where you have legit charges on the elements, which are now ions. The next thing we need to discuss are molecular formulas versus empirical formulas. So the difference is that the molecular formula shows the exact number of each element present in a molecule. So for instance, hydrogen peroxide has two hydrogens and two oxygens. That's its molecular formula because it shows exactly what's going on in that compound. It shows me how many spheres I would need to grab if I was attempting to build it. An empirical formula is a reduced form of the formula. It only shows ratios. Or only gives information about ratios. So we could take H2O2 and rewrite it as HO and that would be the reduced form or the empirical formula for that compound. However, for molecular or covalent compounds, and we should also make note of that on this first page here, Typically, when you talk about something being a molecule, you're implying that it's a covalent molecule. So these are cohesive units, singular units. And so the molecular formula is preferred. We need to know how to build that singular unit. Whereas an empirical formula is more appropriate for ionic compounds because as we discussed in an earlier lecture, those ionic com compounds have the potential to continue in all directions um, to get to very high numbers of atoms. So we don't wanna say um, we have 100 sodium and 100 chloride. We're just gonna reduce it down to one to one. All right, let's practice identifying the difference. So if you have P4O10, that's molecular, and if you wanted to turn it into its empirical formula, you're going to divide. So find a common um, divisor. So it, maybe two. I can divide that by two and that by two. So we can reduce it down to P2O5. C5H12. Well, 5 and 12 don't have any um, thing in common. I can't really divide it. So it's molecular and empirical formula are one and the same. C6H12O6, well, it looks like I can divide everything by six over here. So I can rewrite this as C1H2O1, but the ones are understood, so CH2O. CA2S2, well, both of those things can be divided by two, and we're left with CAS. So in question two, we're asked to identify a compound as being ionic, covalent, or potentially um, a little bit of both. So in letter A, we have carbon and hydrogen. And the key to identifying something as being ionic or covalent is figuring out whether it's a metal or a non-metal. So carbon is all the way over here. It's to the right of our staircase. I should draw that in on this periodic table. And remember, if an element is to the right of the staircase, it's gonna be a non-metal. Hydrogen's over here. But remember, hydrogen is, is kind of misplaced. Hydrogen is a non-metal as well. And I'll just label that. So we have a non-metal with a non-metal which means we have a covalent compound. For letter B, 
we have magnesium and chlorine. So again, let's find their positions on the periodic table and think about what's going on. So we have magnesium over here in group 2A. It's on the metals side of the periodic table. And we have chlorine over here in group 7A. So a metal and a non-metal, they're on opposite sides of that staircase. They're not going to be able to share. That makes it an ionic compound. Hopefully you got most of these right. I do think letter E is a little bit challenging. Lithium for sure is a metal, but even though hydrogen's right above lithium, we need to remember that hydrogen is a non-metal. So we have a metal plus a non-metal making that one ionic. G is also a little bit tricky. We have calcium, which is a metal, and it's gonna form a two plus ion because it's in group two. Then we have what's known as perchlorate. It's one of our polyatomic ions. So what tends to happen, not always, but in a lot of cases, your polyatomic ion is going to look covalent because it has all nonmetals. And again, there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, you're going to see a very covalent nature to your polyatomic ions. And then you have this metal. So in theory, you have a metal hooking up with a non-metal, right? These are all non-metals. So at the end of the day, you're going to use the ionic approach to name something that's a combination of both. Let's talk about the crisscross method for coming up with the formulas of our ionic compounds. So crisscross was this like teeny bopper, borderline hip hop um, duo in like the early 1990s. Um, I kind of remember them from like middle school. Anyways, they had this infamous dance move because their name was crisscross where they'd go like this, like all the time in their videos or when they pose, they be crisscrossing their arms. So you gotta watch a crisscross video or um, look at one of their photos from back in the day or something like that to remind you of how you're gonna write the names of your ionic compounds. You're gonna do the same exact thing. You're gonna like master this move because we're gonna use the same move for writing the formulas of our ionic compounds. So, how does this work? Grab the charges of the metal and the nonmetal from the periodic table. So potassium's plus one and sulfur's in group 6A, so I'm gonna do a two minus on that. Always write your positive ion, your cation, that always has to come first. Then you're gonna take the charges, so I'm gonna take the plus one and the minus two, and you're gonna literally crisscross them down. So the one goes to the outside of the sulfur and the two would squeeze in the space right in front of, or right after the K. So this becomes K2S. You're gonna drop the positive and the negative signs after you do your crisscross move. So this goes away and this goes away. You're just basically crisscrossing down the numbers. So the question is, why are you doing that? So sulfur is two minus. Sulfur wants to gain two more electrons so it can look like that noble gas and have eight valence electrons. Potassium only has one valence electron. It's looking to lose that one valence electron, but it only has one. So sulfur needs to hook up with two potassium atoms in order to satisfy itself. One wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't neutralize things. But if a two minus hooks up with two plus ones, then we form a neutral ionic compound. For naming this, you're going to just keep the name of the metal the same. So we'll do potassium. And then on the name of the non-metal, the ending gets dropped and you replace it with I. 
Ide means that it's negative. Ide means that it's an anion. So we're going to do potassium sulfide. You're going to write down the name of the metal. So I'll just write down potassium. And then we're going to take the name of the non-metal component and modify it slightly. So instead of keeping the ending like er, we're gonna cross out the er part of sulfur and change it to sulfide. So the name of K2S is potassium sulfide. Let's do another one. So we have magnesium and oxygen. I'll write out the names of the elements first. And you're always going to change the name of that non-metal component to something with an ide ending. The ide ending means it's uh, negatively charged. It uh, picked up electrons. So we're going to call this magnesium. oxide. So for the next two we have calcium and chlorine. The INE on the chlorine on the nonmetal gets switched out for ide. So the name of CaCl2 is calcium chloride. We have cesium and oxygen which then becomes cesium oxide. The, that whole part just changes to the ide. But we want to be able to go in all different directions when it comes to our compounds. So we want to be able to take our charges and crisscross them down, but we also want to be able to kind of undo the crisscross. Think about the charges on the ions before they came together. Sometimes it's not too bad. So for instance, in 4A, I'm going to go to my periodic table and I see, oh, potassium's in group 1. So I'm going to do a plus 1 or a plus on the potassium component. And then can kind of envision bromine before it hooked up with potassium. And that would have had a negative 1. It gets trickier um, because we are writing these ionic compounds as empirical or reduced formulas. So be careful. So what I mean by that, in letter B, if we look at our periodic table, calcium is in group two, so it should have a plus two charge. And oxygen is in group six, so it has a negative two charge. And then that begs the question, well, why is it written the way it's written? And we're always going to reduce. So you can initially crisscross the twos, giving you Ca2O2. But just like we did in the earlier exercise, we're going for the empirical formula. So I'm going to divide each of these by two, leaving me with uh, CaO, which is what they wrote. So they reduced it. So just be careful when we're looking and trying to think of the ions that it originally came from. Lithium is in group one, so I'll do a plus one on that, and sulfur is in group six, so I'll do a two minus there. Magnesium is in group two, so I'll do a two plus on our magnesium. And nitrogen is in group 5A, so nitrogen has a negative three charge. That's a typo then on this worksheet. I'll have to update that. Let's think about the nature of this typo. Magnesium has a plus two charge. Nitrogen has a three minus charge. So if we're crisscrossing, and those are the only charges those elements can have. And if we're crisscrossing down the numbers, 
I'm going to bring the three by the magnesium and the two by the nitrogen. That's the only possibility there. So fix that typo. On the next one, hopefully that one's okay. We have sodium with a plus one and phosphorus is in group five. So we'll do a three minus on our phosphorus. This last one is the trickiest one. Chromium is in the middle of the periodic table. Chromium is a transition metal. We don't have group numbers to predict the charges on the transition metals. The exception being some of the ones that are marked in here. So with transition metals, we have to do a little bit of detective work if we're trying to figure out the original ions. I'm confident about what's going on with the fluorine since it's in group seven. I know it's gonna do a negative one. Now, thinking about chromium, I don't know, maybe it's a plus two. And you always wanna check when you're trying to guess at the charge on a transition metal. So if I take the two and crisscross it down and the one and put it over here, we wind up with Cr1F2, and that's not a match. So obviously the plus two is incorrect. Let's try plus three. So if chromium was three plus and fluorine is negative one, already I can see that's much better, right? The three would crisscross down there and the one would crisscross down there. That gives us Cr1F3 and then the ones are understood. So this would just be CRF3, which was what was originally written. So just to summarize here, the chromium is a three plus and the fluorine is a minus one for letter F.